This is Tom Price here, editor of Calvary Chapel Magazine. I'm with my good friend. I have the pleasure to interview my good friend, Pastor Rob McCoy of Godspeed Calvary Chapel in Thousand Oaks, California. Rob, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on with us today. Thanks, Tom. It's good yeah. to see you again. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> At the beginning, I will just talk a little bit while we're, people are coming on. So we encourage people to like us on Facebook, share the video on that we put on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram. And most importantly, go to our website, calvarychapelmagazine.org, for fresh, godly content. Rob, we went with the magazine from four deadlines a year to 365 deadlines. With <laughs> so that was quite a jump for us, too. We had to hire some new young people here. So, uh, Pastor Rob, we go back to the days in Russia together when you were the youth pastor at Calvary Chapel San Jose. And I have such fond, wonderful memories of those times ministering. Yeah. I just remember you just had a way with the kids. But you were the youth pastor. It made sense. But those Russian kids, even through the language barrier, you had so many ways that you were able to share the gospel with them. And it was such a wonderful time together and just a joyous time. I just remember the joy, you know, that we had and shared. Yeah, me too, Tom. Yeah. That was, that was precious. And even, uh, it was joyous time, but you broke your ankle. <laughs> and, and, and I have to say to everyone who's viewing that uh, it, there, I, you were in massive pain and the flesh never made it to the surface because <laughs> you, you kept your, your, uh, your heart for the Lord out front. You, you, there was no cuss words, nothing. And I could tell you were in massive pain, yeah. but yeah, that was, that was, that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I felt pain like that for a long time. And I remember <laughs> Manny who became your assistant pastor trying to pack my ankle with snow because we were in like a foot of snow, you know, yeah. it, it was crazy, crazy amount of snow that we're dealing with now. And now Rob was at that time you were the youth pastor at Calvary Chapel, San Jose. And you plan at Calvary Chapel Thousand Oaks. And is at that church, I said, I think you said when it got to be over at three services, it was still booming and out that you decided to you made you moved on, moved 10 minutes up the road to plant where you are now, Godspeed Calvary Chapel Thousand Oaks, and left your assistant pastor, and he changed the name to Calvary Chapel Skyline. Yeah. And M yeah, Manny did. Yeah. Manny it was did. great. Yeah. And our old friend Pete Nelson. From the early days from the cry who was in russia quite a bit in those days too took over that church so it's exciting to see what god's doing moving everybody around here amen and we do have now rob you've been the mayor of the town there at thousand oaks yeah, yeah. I, I was the mayor in uh, uh 2000 2008 19 okay 2019 and i remember we did a story when you were one week you had a mass casualty shooting that you had to deal with at mayor before that was even settled were a couple within a couple of days all you had to deal with a massive fire that swept through close to everybody's home that if impacted on everybody in, in your con not everybody but most the people in your congregation in one way or the other yeah so uh a gunman went into uh, the borderline, which is kind of a dance, country western dance mm -hmm. place, and uh, it was college night, and he started shooting. He killed two of our congregants, wow. uh, ultimately killed 12, and then took his own life. Officer Helis, Ron Helis, was shot and killed. A um, number mm -hmm. of kids were injured, and then, uh, then the fires began to rage, and we did a um, a vigil that that night for the the victims' families and for the victims, and then um, when when I got home that night after that, uh, we had been evacuated from our home, and the fires completely encircled uh, our entire city. It was it was a day from well, a few days from hell. Wow, yeah, I can I I just can't imagine uh, what that must have been like, especially being in a in a, a, a responsibility of being the mayor. Uh, at the, same at, time. At, the, at the time of the shooting, I was mayor pro tem. That's what uh, it was. Yeah, but it that happened uh, November 8th was the shooting, and I became mayor uh, December, first week of December. Right. And then uh, that's when we dedicated the park to the to the victims and then the freeway to Officer Helis. And, and most of the funerals was going through that entire time. Wow. wow. It must have been just a, 
awful time. Now, <clears throat> we know that Hebrews 10.25 said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the matter of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching, the days of capitalized in the Bible. So, Rob, can you share with us kind of how this, when, when you first heard this virus was coming, uh, how did all you at, Calvary, at Godspeed Calvary Chapel, what was all your first reaction to the pandemic, to COVID-19? Did, did all you shut down temporarily from in, in March um, because of the request? Yeah, uh, when when we didn't know the severity of the virus, we we were following all the CDC protocols and what the governor was requesting. Uh, we did have the uh, we did have the data from the Diamond Princess cruise liner and the USS Roosevelt, so we knew in a closed air system. We also kind of knew how the virus survived on surfaces, and so we started a nightly live stream. That I think we've done 180 episodes, and we did it for. Our, our elderly congregants who were quarantined. Um, and, and then it's it, it went from zero subscribers. I think we're approaching, I don't know, 13,000 subscribers. Uh, but we, we've had no less than 10 doctors, two, two psychologists. We were looking at the data and I was a member uh, on the city council. So I had access to the county data. <clears throat> and, um, but when we started to understand that the virus wasn't what they said it was, and the models were woefully inaccurate. Um, we we started to evaluate, and then the governor came out uh, during our Holy Week, uh, you know, uh, Palm Sunday to Easter mm -hmm. Sunday, and he basically declared that the church is non-essential. And in our own city, uh, we were permitted to, you know, our cannabis distributors were considered essential. Our liquor stores were considered essential. Our bicycle repair shops were considered essential realtors, but the church wasn't considered essential. And I, I just, I couldn't process that. Uh, not only being on the city council, that the governor's overreach, because we swear to defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, when we take public office and we, we govern by the consent of, of the authority in America, we the people. For those who are worried about Romans 13, the authority is we the people. And, and he was violating his, his oath of office because the First Amendment declares that a church is essential. And so we, we remained open uh, April 4th, which was Palm Sunday, to do communion because it's a sacrament in the Protestant church. And it was our Holy Week. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's critically essential. So we followed CDC standards. We took a sanctuary that holds over 400 and we had 10 chairs in accordance with CDC standards, did social distancing masks. Uh, we were very conscientious and cautious of it. And it took almost three hours to do communion. People lined up six feet apart for, for three hours to cycle in. And the, the press descended on us as though we were going to be killing everyone because the, the narrative was such that the church was non-essential. And, and the press, to their credit, pointed out that it was probably the safest place in all of Ventura County because of how clean it was. Right. And um, and then that was April 4th. April 3rd, uh, we realized that this had gone all the way over to England and the story had traveled. And we, we didn't do any press conferences. They had just gotten wind of it. Right. And I knew that my colleagues on the council would have to censure me because I was in violation of the governor's order. It, it It's not a codified law. It was, you know, just something he decided to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and I didn't want as a city, we were being inundated by the county and the state with these mandates that were draconian. And I didn't want to burden my colleagues. So I, I resigned from the council because I, I so deeply respect them. They didn't need that hassle. Right. But I, I couldn't idly sit by while the an elected official like myself would violate the Constitution that that he swore to defend. So. Um, I, I stood in that ground, stepped out of office, and um, we kind of dealt with it that way. Yeah. yeah. Rob, how was the Lord speaking to you through that time? And I, I know you were studying God's word. And what, what comes back to what, what, what's your memory of kind of what, the time where you heard the Lord's voice speak to you the, the loudest through that time? Yeah. But <clears throat> 
you know, I, I was I was looking at the body of Christ as a whole, and and some well-meaning brothers who are, are my dearest friends, who I I, I love tremendously, uh, begged me not to open, as though we were going to be endangering the community, um, and that you know we would be we would be troubling their attempt of evangelism. And as a public official, I knew what they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And that was that this had nothing to do with the virus. This had to do with a, a secular progressive overreach and, and a sole purpose to silence the church. Um, and, and whether they knew that or they didn't, I, I knew what my responsibility and my calling was. Mm -hmm. And the Lord kind of showed me that the body of Christ is a multifaceted diamond and each of us have a facet. And I knew what their heart was. And I, I just said, look, you know, come and see. And guys like Dave Guzik, he came out that day and he was blown away by the way in which we approached it. We honored Caesar in the sense of the CDC standards. Right. right. Uh, but but more importantly, we honored the Lord. Mm. And 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 if if communion's not essential, Christ is an essential. Mm -hmm. And and it just and and even you know we had Catholics coming out, who as you know they look at the literal body and blood of Christ in the sacrament, mm -hmm. but they had no access to it. They would come, um, and people who weren't Christians were coming, wanting to just support us because they they realized the overreach and um, and then it it, it settled, um, and then the governor you know basically said, well you can. You can open the church with a hundred people or twenty five percent, whichever is less, and then um, as, as he approached that, uh, it got worse, and he would ultimately say there is no indoor worship, uh, and everyone has to wear masks, and there's no singing. And as we were seeing the data uh, here in Ventura County, because I had access to it, our county has eight hundred and fifty six thousand citizens, and our uh, the the death rate attributed to COVID at the time, a little over a hundred tragic deaths that were attributed to COVID that constitutes one, one hundredth of 1% of mm -hmm. our entire population. Right. And because of the draconian measures uh, of our governor, 65% uh, of our restaurants will never reopen uh, those families, mm -hmm. their entire life savings have been wiped out. Uh, mm -hmm. Our unemployment rate is approaching 20%. Uh, mm -hmm. Kids haven't been able to go to school, though there hasn't been a death of anyone 30 years of age or under. The, the viral load is one third in children, and it's not transmittable in that capacity. We we know we, we have all this data. We've, we've known this, but yet they're doubling down, silencing the church. Um, and then when the governor and, and we were we were communicating with the sheriff, telling him, look, we're, we don't want to burden your officers. Right. But because they, we knew they had to go down to Los Angeles for the riots and we had to send some of our law enforcement there to shore up what was happening. And then the riots occurred in Los Angeles. Our, our personnel, our law enforcement personnel was there. And 75% um, of the businesses that were looted and burned were all Jewish businesses, wow. it, complete hate crimes. Mm -hmm. The governor embraces it, advocates for it and blesses it. No social distancing, no masks. And then comes back and says this to the church. And by that time, we, we realized it had nothing to do with the, the empirical data, had nothing to do with the virus. Uh, th this was completely political. And uh, we opened the church and we've been yeah. wide open, no social distancing, no masks since May 31st. We, we have ionization machines and UV lights in, in our air system. Right. And we haven't had one case of COVID and, and the church, the church went from 450 people on a, on a good Sunday mm -hmm. to over 2,500. And we still haven't had one case. Wow. And then a handful of people complained. So three of the five County supervisors sought uh, an emergency temporary restraining order. They found a judge who was political and predictable who authorized it, even though we, we stated the data, he said on a scale of one to 10, uh, we are a 10 as far as danger to the community, uh -huh. even though there hasn't been a single case reported. And he, he awarded the restraining order. Of course, we violated it. 
Uh, it's unconstitutional. But more importantly, people say, well, what about Romans 13? Mm-hmm. You're, you're violating the authority. Uh, Why? Well, I, I, know, I know Romans 13. I, I teach Romans 13. <laughs> I'm in full agreement with Romans 13. But in America, in a constitutional republic, the authority in Romans 13 is we the people. And exactly. the legislators governed by our consent. Mm-hmm. And, and they're bound by the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution. I know this is an elected official. Right. They're bound by the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution that they swear to defend. And that Constitution doesn't give us rights. It protects us from a government that wants to infringe on our inalienable rights given to us by God. Yes. Now, I know this, but m- most pastors don't. Right. They don't know the Constitution. They don't know the 27 Amendments. They don't know the First Amendment. And so we are honoring Romans 13. We're holding them accountable. It says in the Declaration, it's our right and our duty. And so that's what we're doing. We're exercising Romans 13. Yes. And, and, and then as we were doing that, here's another one. What about the second greatest commandment? I hear this all the time. Mm-hmm. First one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law of the prophets. Well, let's, let's invoke the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. We do. Right. We, we, love, we, we love our neighbors who have been sequestered and quarantined with their abusive spouse. Mm. We, we love the children who have been quarantined and sequestered where, with their abusive parents. And the two reporting agencies, mandated reporting agencies, schools and churches that have been closed, and they have nowhere to go. We love them. We're fighting for them. We, we love the families who have had loved ones who have died without anyone by their bedside. Mm-hmm. over a virus that doesn't merit this kind of action. We love them. Mm-hmm. We love our citizens and our, and our neighbors who have lost their businesses for no reason. We, 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 we love our neighbors. It's coming at a great cost to us. We're being fined $500 for every incident every Sunday. And we're already totaled and, and amassed thousands of dollars in fines. And yet we remain open with no cases contending against a tyrannical authority that's violating Romans 13. And we're loving our neighbors and giving them a voice. And the church is being darkened by people who would never darken the doors of a church, skaters and and surfers, people that just don't go to church because their streams of liberty have dried up. And they've gone upstream and they've come to realize second Corinthians three, that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's Liberty, Mm. that, that Liberty isn't man's idea. It's God's idea. And the church is woefully absent Mm. in defending the freedom. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Defending the freedom of mankind. They're not opening and they're allowing this tyranny to ruin the lives of all of our neighbors while at the same time saying we love them. It doesn't come at a cost to sit in a screen Mm-hmm. and call that church. That's like watching a fireplace on the internet. You can hear it and you can see it, but you can't feel the warmth. That's not church. Right. People need to be loved and cared for and, 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 and contending for their freedom and defending them and loving them. Yes. Yeah. I was with Pastor Jack Hibbs last week. He baptized a thousand, over a thousand people. People are streaming to church. He Amen. Says, he simply does, he does not have the authority to close the door. Only Jesus Christ has the authority to open or shut the doors of the church. Amen. Yeah. That, there, there, is, there is no scientific reason at all for any church in America to be shut right now. This, this virus, we know that it, it, it's it, the, the, the average median age of, of those who've died of this is 75. And it's with it, two to three core morbidities. And in our own county, when I stood in the witness stand or sat in the witness stand to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God under perjury, threat of perjury and imprisonment. We had done a Freedom of Information Act where we got all the cases in Ventura County, the little over tragically 100 deaths attributed to COVID. Of the 100 plus deaths attributed to COVID, only two were people who died from COVID. 
Mm. One was a, a, a man in his 90s and a woman in her late 70s. The rest died with COVID. For example, we had an overdose victim. They, they died of a drug overdose, but they died positive testing for COVID. So that was a COVID death. You get $19,000 for that. A car accident victim, both lungs crushed tested positive for COVID. That's 19 grand. That That's complicit with, that's just completely illegal. And, and based on that, they're ruining our entire county and our state. Yes. And those who know truth and are to, are to defend it and stand are not. Yeah. Rob, do you think that the Lord is purging the church now, separating the chaff from the wheat? Uh, you know, I, Tom, I, I wouldn't go that far because I I've been, I've been in this, this County for over 20 years and I've, I've served in elected office. Um, and I've come to, to love the pastors in this community. We have a great fellowship of, of pastors. One of many of them, uh, have not opened and, and pastors by nature don't like conflict. They're peace loving. And I, and, and I get that. And I know why they're trying to do it. Um, so I don't, I don't fault them. But at this point where the governor gave us six boxes that we needed to, to attain uh, in order to open fully, our county had fulfilled five of the six boxes. And the sixth box was a number of positive cases per day. And, and, it, and then this box over here was the number of testing required per day. If you just lowered it to the, to the California standard, this box it was semantics. It would be, it would be accomplished. And we were literally ready to open. Wow. And then the governor moves the goalpost and he gives us a four tier color system, purple, red, orange, and yellow. There's no green. And, and my, my fellow shepherds, my brothers are, are trying to abide by the governor's standards. We're, we have temperatures here in thousand Oaks that were over a hundred degrees. It was hotter here at one point and at the end of August than it was in Phoenix wow. and they're meeting outside with masks, which no empirical data for that. That is ridiculous. And, and, and they're having to socially distance in, in unbelievable, uh, unbelievable temperatures of heat. And, and they're, they're trying to honor the governor and the governor just moves the goalposts. If they follow these four color coded boxes, they're, they're not going to be able to return to their sanctuaries until winter time. And then they'll only be able, if they get to the yellow, they'll only be able to have 50% occupancy. And two of our churches in the community have already closed. The governor knows what he's doing. He wants to wipe out middle income. He wants to create chaos and he wants to shut down churches. Hmm. And, and you, you can doubt me and, and, and write me off, but I'm connected. I, I'm the faith outreach coordinator for the California minority assembly and Senate. I, I run races up and down the state. I, I'm involved with political leaders. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a neophyte. And, and I would challenge any of my fellow brothers out there. You want to talk politics? I, 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 I'm happy to do it. <laughs> and I'm telling you, th this has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with the health of our citizenry. This has everything to do with politics. Mm. Wow. So, Rob, how do you encourage believers through this time that we're going, that we've been through and going through? I, I know Mike McClure, Pastor Mike McClure, shared with that depression is so high, and, and even thoughts of suicide with people who had never experienced that before. How, how do you encourage them through this, through, through this period in our history? No, uh, when churches close, there's a five times greater rate of suicide. Alcohol consumption is already up 150%. Calls to the suicide prevention hotline are over 1,000%. I mean, if that's not enough to inspire shepherds to bring hope, people, people are communal. We've been created for relationship. They need community, and there's immunity in community. And, mm -hmm. and look, we don't like conflict. I get that. And, and, and I get it that pastors don't want to be political, which... I'll cover that later, but they, they don't want to bring politics. Uh, they, they, they don't want to enter into politics. They don't want the church to enter into politics. 
but what they're realizing is politics is entering the church mm-hmm. and and there is a concerted effort to shut that down If you don't push back and if you don't stand, they will take whatever you're willing to give them. Mm. And and really, what is what is the line? What is the line that you're willing to draw? And if you say that we're supposed to submit to authority, the question I would have for you is, is Rosa Parks supposed to have gotten to the back of the bus? Mm. What's the line? What's the line for your people? If you, if you love your neighbors yourself, what's the line that you will say evil comes this far and no further? Mm, What stand are you willing to make? Where, where, where is that line? Rob, we remember from the book of Acts that the church, when it was persecuted, grew dramatically. And you've already reported that your attendance is going through the roof right now. The same thing with the other churches that are that are that are that are open now. How do you kind of how do you see this working out? How, how do you see where, where is this headed now? I, I and this is happening across the country. Uh, I, I travel with Charlie Kirk. We're going to be up in Idaho. Um, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow for Phoenix. Um, I was just in Portland yesterday. Mm. There are there are citizens across the country that are contending against tyranny and looking for shepherds to 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 provide leadership. Right. right. And and when you said is is this separating the sheep from the goats? My prayer is that pastors will awaken to the realization that the word ecclesia, when 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 Jesus takes his disciples up to the headwaters of the Jordan at Caesarea Philippi. And it's a park-like setting, and, and every culture that has inhabited that region has set up a temple to their god or goddess, and you can see it carved into the cliffs. And when Jesus goes up there with his disciples, and it's a long haul from Galilee, he turns to them, he says, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say you're John the Baptist, others say, and he said, but who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and he's there, Jesus is speaking in a cacophony of noise as people are worshiping Bacchus and Aphrodite and all the different deities. And here he's con- conversing with his disciples. And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And then he says, upon this rock, I will build my, and everyone says church. But Jesus didn't say church. King James said church, but Tyndale said assembly. The Mm. Geneva Bible said assembly. The word translated, Jesus co-opted a secular term. He didn't say synagogue, which would have been a religious term. He didn't say temple. He used a word called ecclesia, which translated in Koine Greek and secular definitions and understanding it used throughout the the Greek world. The Mm. word means public square. (laughs) <laughs> it, it means it, it means assembly. It means stepping in and, and contending for the freedom of man. Right. But somewhere along the line, we abdicated our role in the public square because I, I get accused all the time. Hey, 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 brother, I just preach the gospel. I don't do politics as though somehow I don't preach the gospel. I preach the gospel every Sunday and watch people come to Christ. I throw the net out every Sunday. Mm hmm. But the question is, Jesus didn't say make converts. He said make disciples. Disciples and baptize them. And baptize them. And, and here's, here's the part that baffles me. When, when he says that upon this rock, I will build my, my ecclesia, this idea of infusing the public square, I, I, I look and, and I see that we think the gospel is out of Ephesians 2, that you that, that we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And 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 that you know you you have Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, who who walks the earth and is tempted in all ways and without sin. He dies in our place. He's crucified, buried, resurrected. And if you believe in your heart and confess with your tongue, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. All that's true. And we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. And then you ask, you say, well, what's the purpose of the law? And most will say, well, the law is there to show us that we can't keep it Mm -hmm. and that we need to be saved by grace through faith. Okay. 
Well, Abraham believed God and was accredited to him as righteousness, as we see in Romans and also Galatians. So he's saved by grace through faith. He's looking forward to a point in time. We look back to a point in time, which is the crucifixion. And why then would, if he's saved by grace through faith, why then would the law be given 430 years later? And here's, here's the part that I think we miss. Three to five million Jews were enslaved in Egypt. Enslaved. Another human being made them work all day, and they did not get to retain what they had worked for. And if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But tyranny is enslaving them. And they cry out to God. God sends a deliverer in the form of Moses. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, God said, let my people go. And Moses says, who is God that I should listen to him? You you mean uh, the um, uh, uh, the Pharaoh said? Yeah, yeah, the Pharaoh said, the Pharaoh said, who is God that I should listen to him? And of course, he had the 10 plagues, three of which the Jews experienced. And then the Passover and Pharaoh relents and releases these slaves to be free. He realizes he's losing his slave economy, so he sends his military out to pursue them. God vanquishes them and destroys them in the, in the Red Sea after he parts it, miracle after miracle. They get into the wilderness, and, and this will make sense, Tom. They get into the wilderness. Their shoes don't wear out. Their clothes don't wear out. God provides manna every day for three to five million people, which is a logistical nightmare. Water where there isn't. Blows quail off course when they whine about wanting meat. And then he goes up on Mount Sinai. And God gives him the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the first of the law. He comes down with five commandments, relationship with God, five commandments with relationship with each other. He comes down and he finds Israel in debauchery with a golden calf, places the law in the center of the community, instructs the children on this moral knowledge. And here's the greatest miracle of all. Three to five million people live together for 40 years without a police force or a standing army. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? That's where you you get the makings of the republic, because when Jethro says to Moses, look, appoint godly men who are not covetous over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, federal, state, county, local. Uh Isaiah says the Lord is our judge, our king and our lawgiver. Three branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial. So so we, we have a representative form of government. God wants us to live together, and and we've been duped into thinking that we don't do politics. And Aristotle said politics is the highest form of community. Mm. It combines morality with sociability. Like Francis Schaeffer said, how then do we now live? You you do politics in church every day. You do politics in your family every day. This is how we live. They need you in the public square. And this is the last point. You go to Galatians 3, and, and, and Paul says, you know, answers the question, then why do we have the law? And he says, the law is a, is a school teacher, a guardian, to keep us safe and to point us to Christ until faith comes. Hmm. So our founders understood the laws of nature, nature's God, that we're endowed by our creator with inalienable rights, that government must be limited because man is innately sinful and power wants to concentrate. So we'll separate it in accordance with Isaiah to three branches. We'll do it representative as a republic so that there won't be mob rule. Mm. And if we establish these laws, it will keep people safe. The laws of nature, nature's God. Doesn't matter if you're an agnostic, an atheist, or a Christian, you're bound by the law of gravity. And and as you follow these, it'll point you to Christ, and then faith will come. Mm -hmm. But we stepped out of the public square. We don't do politics. Uh Right. Yeah. Interesting. Take a little break and say, hey, this is Tom Price, editor of Calvary Chapel Magazine. I have the pleasure to interview my friend, Pastor Rob McCoy. We go back to the late 90s and early 2000s in Russia together. He's the pastor of Godspeed Calvary Chapel in Thousand Oaks, California. Um, We we have to we want to ask everyone listening to like us on Facebook, share the video, this video. Please like that and share this. And also, please follow us on Instagram. And most importantly, go to our website, CalvaryChapelMagazine.org. Every day we're putting fresh godly content. This interview will be on there in uh, uh, broken up into two different parts. Uh, once we get this in, into words, 
in written form. And uh, when I met Rob, he was the youth pastor at Calvary Chapel San Jose. So, Rob, I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I have a couple more important questions to ask you. And one is, um, how do you instill in people a biblical worldview so that people can understand some of these things that you've just, some of the important things you've just shared with us here? Yeah, I, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, but because we've stepped out of the public square, I, I, this idea of a Christian worldview, let me use Calvary chapels as an example. Mm -hmm. Depending on the history you look at, from my research, I, I'm pretty sure that Calvary Chapel started in 1968 when Pastor Chuck and Kay looked out at a sea of humanity of, of burned out hippies that had checked into Eastern religion and, and drug use. And on the shores of California, they saw that and their heart went out and they began this ministry of of teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and then Maranatha music and... and uh, all that transpired from there. But in 1968 in California, Reagan was governor and we had the fifth largest GDP gross domestic production of, we, this was the state of the future. I was born here in 64. My father was born here, my grandfather. This was the state of the future and Reagan's governor. Chuck comes on the scene and in 68, as you recall, Tom, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. Bobby Kennedy had been shot. Mm -hmm. JFK was shot in 63. In 68, we'd have the My Lai Massacre and the Tet Offensive. In 69, we'd have the, the Kent State shooting. 52 years ago was not unlike it is today in 2020, where you have a Marxist movement of BLM and Marxist ideology infiltrating the church and America wondering whether it's gonna be uh, an oligarchy like 6,000 years of recorded history or stay to this 244 year miracle of a constitutional republic and freedom that no world, no country has ever known in all of history. Mm -hmm. And Chuck comes on the scene and all these young people are burned out with politics. So he avoids politics and, and understandably so. And he begins to just teach the Bible simply and as a result, there's 10,000% growth. And that's conversion growth, not transfer growth. <laughs> and then you had the Harvest Crusades, Somebody Loves You Crusades. South of Van Nuys, there's 350 Calvary chapels. It's a Calvary Chapel sandbox in Southern California. <laughs> there's, there's over 1,800 Calvary chapels around the world. At one point, two of the 10 largest churches in America were Calvary chapels. And the missions movement is unbelievable. But, but 52 years of 10,000% growth, preaching the Bible, uh, preaching the gospel, throwing out the net, how's that transformed by being apolitical? How's that transformed California? Well, here we are 52 years later. We don't have the fifth largest GDP. We now have the sixth, maybe seventh. We have the highest gas tax, sales tax, income tax, corporate tax. We lead the nation in debt. You take the next four largest states' debt, combine it, it doesn't equal California's debt. Wow. We are the authors of no-fault divorce that Reagan signed into law in, the, in 70 that decimated marriage across the country. Transgender bathroom bills, the most secular progressive sex education curriculum in the world that's vile. We've aborted more children mm -hmm. in the state of California than the entire population of Canada. We lead the nation in abortion. Mm -hmm. We lead the nation in poverty and in homelessness. And I, I have a question, where's the power of the gospel when we've seen this growth and the church has abdicated the ecclesia, the public square, and we don't do politics, but we love people raising their hands, but nothing is happening. Our, our, our young people can't live here. They have to move out. The churches are under attack. When's the line? Where do we stand? So a Christian worldview is this. It, it, it's not just simply conversion. It's engagement. Mm -hmm. that people would know the truth and the truth would set them free. Every area of the Bible speaks to immigration, transportation, economy, life, sexuality. It's all there. We need to proclaim it instead of seal ourselves into a four walled building and call it the church because we've got our budgets, our baptisms and our buildings and the money still comes in via the internet and live stream while we watch the state implode and our young people can't live here and they have more hope listening to Greta Thunberg than they do listening to us. 
Wow. That's, uh, uh, thankfully, we know that God is in control. Amen. Because that you that could be just depressing thinking about that. But praise God, we know that he, but I, I do hear what you're saying. Um, let me give you, let me give you a, a positive end on that. Cause you're right. That did sound depressing. <laughs> our, our eschatology at Calvary Chapel is pre-trib, pre-millennial. And I've heard it said that it's kind of like the house is on fire. we got to get the kids out. That's why uh, the, the asset of our eschatology is evangelism. The liability of our eschatology is that we don't prepare for generations to come. We don't plant trees of whose shade we'll never know. Mm-hmm. Now, we, and, and we can also kind of look at it as though we're polishing brass on the Titanic. But the positive note and what's happening with, with our churches that are pre-trib, pre-millennial, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days, it, it, as it was in the days of Lot. And Lot is, he, he's, he's in the New Testament with righteous by his name, even though he committed incest with his two daughters, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. He offered them to the men of the city to be violated. He's still considered righteous. He was delivered, even stated in the New Testament. And what it means is the days of Lot means we got our get out of hell free card, but we've made no difference in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. And, and I would say to my brothers out there, it's, it's time to, to, to believe the entirety of the scripture. Yes, we look for his soon return, but we know not the day nor the hour. We do see inklings of it, but it doesn't give us justification to be apathetic or, or disengaged. Mm. Wow. Our, 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 our previous ancestors did, didn't do that to us. Why would we do that to our kids? Right. Uh, do you feel like uh, that's, that blessings are being withheld from our country with the abortion? What is it? 60 million babies across our country have been murdered uh, in, in the womb. And, not, just, and, not, just, not, just, not just murdered, dismembered and their parts sold. In California, they harvest the child on the downbeat of their heart. They, 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 they create, they create vaccines from their tissue. This is, this is, this is nightmare stuff, but, but we don't want to get into that. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, Pastor Rob, I I know that you are on a limited time period here. So why don't you close this out with some thoughts, your closing thoughts, and then close this, close this out with a prayer for our churches, our pastors, and you know, throughout the land and our country during this very tumultuous time. But uh, any last thoughts on your encouragement? Yeah, I, I would just, I, I would say to my brothers out there that w- when you stand where God calls you to stand, for example, Daniel in the lion's den, the, the, the lions lose their taste for flesh. Mm-hmm. They can roar, but they have no bite. And, and when good people say to evil this far and no further, and they stand in confidence and encourage, evil dissipates. But if good people do nothing, it was um, Edmund Burke or R- Russell Kirk, who's, or no, actually it's probably Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, Bonhoeffer. all that's necessary for evil to prosper is for good men and women to do nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and I would leave you with this thought, and this was Russell Kirk. He said that politicians are actors performing a script written by the audience. Mm-hmm. And in California, we have 15,280,000 self-professing evangelical Christians. Half of them are not even registered to vote. Of the half that are registered to vote, only half of those vote in a presidential election, 12% non-presidential election. I know the data. Oh, that's, that's staggering. That's it is staggering. Months. You could change every law and every representative if you would just simply have your people register and vote. It would change the entire, you can, you can vote yourself into socialism, but you can only shoot your way out wow. and your people want freedom. At least register them and encourage them to vote at the, at the least, please. God bless you guys. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this has been Tom Price from Calvary Chapel Magazine. Encourage people to go to calvarychapelmagazine.org. Uh, share the vid- this video on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. And Pastor Rob, it's been so good to be with you. I hope the next time I come to California that we can get together. I, I, I need to come back out soon uh, for many different reasons. I have grandkids up in Truckee, California. So that's a good enough reason right there. Yeah, amen. Yeah. yeah. And so, Pastor Rob, would you, it's so great.
Would you close us out in prayer, please? Sure. Yeah. Lord, thank you for Tom and Calvary Chapel magazine and the, the movement that's Calvary Chapel, that God, you have equipped men and women across the globe who have an understanding and a love for your word like never before in modern history. And, and now, Lord, they're, they're equipped and prepared to apply these truths to set the captives free. I pray for an outpouring of your spirit that there would be an awakening. And then, Lord, a revival. Mm. And, and I, I ask that they would, they would dust off these books and revisit these civil laws that you have given us that we would live together as, as the Jews did for 40 years without a police force or a standing army. That not only are we saved by grace through faith, but we have a system of, of laws in the scriptures there, there that, that exist that if we would apply them, people would be protected and pointed to Christ until faith would come and we would step into that ecclesia, that public square. So God bless my brothers. Thank you for them. Thank you for Pastor Chuck and the great history that has been given to us, the heritage of loving your word and rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you for Tom continuing to proclaim that and standing firm upon this great gift of Calvary Chapel. Lord, save our state, our nation, and ultimately, Lord, the world that you would, would set the captives free. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Rob, how can we, how can the church be praying for you as you go to court next Monday? Yeah, keep us in prayer um, that, 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 that we'd find favor with the judge. Whether the judge votes in our favor or rules in our favor or not, it's not going to change what we're doing. We've already given it all up and anything given to God first will never be lost. So it's all his if he wants it. Right. But, but we, we, we want them to start to realize this has to stop and pray for courage for the judge to do that. He knows. Right. Most everyone already does. Yeah. And then pray, pray for our kings and those in authority, specifically your school board and your council members. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, just pray that we would stand firm. Right. And right. last one is from Mike McClure, Calvary Chapel, San Jose. He's in a fight for his life. Send him support. Don't send us anything. Send it to him. Bless him. He needs your encouragement. He's up against the same stuff, um, but the fines are even greater. Please help our brother. Wow. That's, uh, thank you for sharing that. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, and, and just uh, really fascinating to hear, sad to hear. And so Lord, we, uh, we, we ask everyone that's listening, there's going to be listening on the video to pray for Pastor Rob for great vision and for his congregation, for his support staff there, the pastors and everybody on board there, because this is a difficult time. Uh, but God never said it was going to be easy, did he? <laughs> he yeah. promise us that. So God bless you, man. Thank you so much. And I guess if we're, I think we're ready to sign off. Thank you for sharing your heart with us today, Rob. Thanks, Tom, for the opportunity. Bless you, brother.